Um, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, give this talk as part of the far away <laughs> uh, four year uh, series. Um, my association, I used to be at College Park uh, from 1991 to August 2020. In August 2020, I moved to Hopkins. Um, my association with the mathematicians and statisticians at College Park goes back to spring 1979 when I was a graduate student in Asriel Rosenfeld's lab. And Professor Ben Kedem was a very young professor at that time in statistics. And I was interested in time series uh, based on my work at Purdue. And he was working on time series in a non-parametric way, taking the successive differences and thresholding them and creating a zero one series and so forth. Some of you may be aware of that. Uh, we had done some work. I had done some work on sufficient statistics and time series. So I actually gave a talk in Professor Ben Kedem's class uh, on statistics, time series analysis. And then, of course, um, I have worked with Professor John Benedetto in a MURI on opportunistic sensing. And now I'm involved with Professor Whitehack uh, Zaga in, uh, in another MURI on semantic information pursuit. And of course, the math professors, stat professors at Maryland have tried to teach <laughs> mathematics to me over the years. Uh, with limited success, I should say. I told my wife that I'm giving a talk to statisticians and mathematicians. She said, so what's the difference? I said, uh, almost everybody in the audience uh, will be smarter than me. But she said, that's not different. That's usually the case when you give a talk. You know, wives are very, very smart. They know how smart uh, we are, right? So, and then I said, well, the other difference, I probably didn't have a very clean shave and I ruffled my hair a little bit to look like a, a pseudo mathematician. But anyway, I love mathematics. I'm not very good at it, but I <clears throat> love mathematics and statistics. Because if you're from India, you should love statistics. You grow with large population. That joke always works. I didn't hear anybody laughing, but that's okay. So I want to first, before I get into the main topic, I want to kind of say how much you guys have helped us in the fields computer vision, machine learning, and AI, you may not know, but we do, because, you know, this is like, we are very good, uh, uh, you know, very good at stealing things from math and, and statistics. And we do it in a way that you guys don't know. <laughs> so, you know, we look very smart doing that, but we really benefit. And I'm going to briefly say that because I think what's going to help in current AI uh, or what I call as a new alchemy, where we are converting data to gold, uh, will not uh, have a strong foundation unless people from math and statistics kind of get involved and, and make it a real science and so on. That's where the talk is going, right? I'm going to give some examples of where we have issues with AI and what's happening with AI, deep learning, et cetera, et cetera. Finally, I'm going to say, unless uh, people like Wojtek and Radu and others in, in the math statistics department get involved in a big way with what's happening to data, to decisions, uh, we are not going to... Um, be able to sustain it. Without mathematics, nothing ever is sustainable, right? So I'm going to then talk about a brief history of AI, three at scale studies. As you know, what, if, what is the difference between the current AI and the old AI? I took my first course in AI in spring 1978. At that time, we had one book, so-called the Skinny Nielsen's book, Problem Solving Methods in AI. We used to study about logic and theorem proving and first order calculus and search methods and so forth. We didn't have Bayes. Uh, reasoning at that time, it came in the mid 80s, thanks to Judy Pearl. So uh, what is different at that time is we didn't have much data to speak of. We had models, we had logical models, reasoning models, and then probabilistic models and so forth. But now we have a lot of data. So AI is now talking to data. That's a big difference, right? Sometimes when you have to deal with data that way, uh, it kind of loses uh, the, the rigorous uh, things that we are used to. So I'm going to talk about three at scale studies very briefly, not in whole uh, detail. And then the three problems that we are identifying. There are actually many more problems, but I'm going to talk about bias, domain adaptation, generalization, vulnerability attack. These three things seem to dominate uh, the adoption of AI on a massive scale. And then I'm going to talk about what's, what is there to look ahead, right? And what I have about five, six problems for Radhu and, and Whitehack <laughs> to solve. Okay, so that's where it is. Oh, we had 40 years of golden decades. In fact, I wanted to make it before deep learning, after deep learning. I didn't want to be so uh, nasty about that. So I said, uh, you know, we, we talked about representations for images, videos, macro random fields, dynamic texture models, and it brought all kinds of inference 
from statistics and mathematical representation theorems and so forth. And we were very much into performance bounds for computer vision, as well as even machine learning methods like SVM, you know, generalization error and all of that all required very uh, deep uh, mathematics. And then, you know, invariance was always uh, something that had promise in computer vision, but we never reached the, the full benefit of that. Mumford, as you all know, is a field medalist, and he got into computer vision through a segmentation algorithm. We use calculus of variations a lot in, in many of our approaches, at least before deep learning. Lee Group, Lee Algebra were all very, uh, oh, something happened. Okay, wait a minute. Uh, it's stuck again. Okay, let me see if I can. Uh, wait. Uh, I don't know what's going on here. We see your mouse moving. Okay. Yeah, I got out. Now I'm going to try again. Uh, this is very interesting. It's never happened to me. Um, PowerPoint slide. Okay. Uh, let me go here. Uh, I apologize. This is uh, strange. This is my laptop. Um, so can you see this? Yes, we can see the 1970s to 2010 slide. Yeah, but then it gets frozen there. It doesn't, okay, so let me stop. Uh, again, I have another version of it. Uh, let me see if, uh, will, uh, will that work? Uh, oh no, I don't think this will work. Uh, Do you want uh, to leave it like that? We could see the slide. Okay, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. So the people will see the, the, the edges of the bars, yeah, but hopefully yeah. that's acceptable. Yeah, this is a very unusual. Um, uh, let me see. Okay, um, so you can see this? No, right now it, there's nothing on the screen. Yet. Okay, okay. Not shared yet. Oh, not shared yet. Okay, let me, let me. Uh, do you see anything now? Yes, yes, we do. Yes. Okay, let me just keep it. I'm a little worried. Can I? Is it okay, or should I try the big one again and see what happens? Let me see. Maybe this is the one that. Uh, uh, okay. Um, all right. Let me go here and see if I can go to the full screen mode. You see that? Yes, yep. we see the Looks good. Okay, so yeah, manifolds became very big in the uh, in the 90s and so forth, and uh, sometimes naturally, sometimes artificially, and that immediately brought statistics on manifolds as a new thing, and we all benefited from Chikusi's book. Uh, and so more on manifolds, we have used all these techniques, you know, shape statistics, shape theory, uh, Fisher-Rao metric, and dictionary learning, model order selection, Bayes information criterion, uh, and then Bayes in graphical models became big thing in AI in the mid eighties. So that uh, started a new field called uncertainty in AI. And you all know about simulated annealing and MCMC and all of that. Now statistics sometimes is struggling when you have nonlinear models, okay? Now, even in the case of linear models, if you have hierarchical models, statistics seems to be struggling. In the context of time series models, when we built uh, a pyramid of time series, you know, it was very difficult to do inference on them. Of course, when compressive sensing came and, and, and dominated computer vision, uh, somehow it didn't bring in probabilities or statistics with it. I may be wrong in some of these things because I don't know completely everything that happens in mathematics. That's just from outside, that's why I, I I felt like, and so when you have a deep learning method, which is a hierarchical method, 101 layers, 151 layers, and it also has non-linearities, and it has a lot of data, it does classical things like parameter estimation, decision, and so on, but statistical methods are missing. We are not able to provide any confidence bounds. We are not able to provide uh, any, any sense of theory. And I'm going to keep mentioning this again and again. For example, you know, we have a Facebook model for face 120 million parameters. And of course, when you take statistical uh, models, they say you have to follow Occam's razor principle, you have to be parsimonious and so forth. But now we seem to have thrown all of that to the uh, winds. So that is where right now, math and statistics are not helping to provide a foundation to deep learning. And this is uh, something new. 
we always had in engineering things some started with mathematics right ordinary differential equations partial differential equations etc cetera, etc cetera, that then help understand how to build the engineering systems how to evaluate the engineering systems provide performance bounds that whole thing is absent now in deep learning still deep learning is now doing very well so my my thing is alchemy did not work converting water to gold did, did not work but converting data to gold is working sometimes so if the mathematicians and statisticians don't come and help us it may just be an alchemy throughout and people may not care after a while you know if you know how to convert data to gold okay but if you didn't really know theoretically how to do it would you care if you are successful every time and you make a lot of gold and you are rich you don't care so this is where you guys come in so you know this is basically a plea to you all to come and help us to understand why this is working etc cetera, etc cetera. having made that opening pitch let's quickly look at the directions in ai as, as i told you we were looking at heuristic search data improving in the 70s and 80s and then we had uh, you know bayesian approaches and so forth that came in of course computer vision has always been a, a very good application area for ai as we have to go through a lot of different possibilities and arrive at a solution so search is very fundamental in ai so computer vision is one of those application areas of course robotics and natural language processing and so on right so as you can see the bayesian thing is a big thing in in ai Okay, so uh, you know, as uh, Judy Apfel uh, started writing the joint density of things that are represented in a hierarchical way using conditional densities and so forth, uh, and then there is the notion of deseparability, which allowed a nice way of factorizing things and 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 so on. So definitely, you know, Bayesian reasoning is is a big component of mathematical statistics, and that's a big component in in AI. so you can look at various applications and so forth now now deep learning you know a neural network is like a cat cat has nine lives the neural network is probably in its third or fourth life if you consider this as a fourth one the third one was in <clears throat> between 82 and 94 82 because of the classic paper from hoffield Uh, you know that came in 1982 and it got a lot of people excited and 87 is when we had the first neural network conference several thousand people showed up and so forth and it was there a three layer network mostly it was done for many many applications uh, ocr was the dominant one and uh, of course then it disappeared and it has come back again uh, alexnet as some of you may know in 2012 showed how uh, an, a slightly extended version of lenet from 19 late 80s uh, yan lakun's work can do good on one of the challenges in computer vision the image net challenge right so since then we have been completely taken over by deep learning so it's becoming a one trick pony i feel like a machine learning you know computer vision robotics whatever signal processing right so um, the second bullet is even more troublesome if you ask anybody are you working in ai they say yep they are working in ai so it has become such an all encompassing term right um, unless you you know even fast fourier transform or far away fourier transform will one day be interpreted as artificial intelligence you know that's that's worrisome because there is no real uh, this uh, i'm not asking for a purity test but that is the state of the affairs now ai has taken over uh for good or bad of course we have we are seeing impressive performance as a computer vision person and i'm going to briefly discuss those things but there are still some problems in computer vision where we are not seeing the full benefits of deep learning it may be better than a classical methods but it's not uh, uh doing you know as as you we want it to do right uh, work great great right so uh, we started looking at uh, one of the at scale problems and constraint phase verification for ir for janus program it's a five year program many academic partners and so on so we developed methods for basically building the best face recognizer that that a academic team can build and so you know we finished it in last year in july and uh, we have been giving many versions of our systems to us government and this and that and it's getting used widely it had a lot of good things it came up with a very compact representation for a face and uh, 
state of the art verification and search clustering techniques and so on so people ask how does your machine work comparison to humans because face recognition is also done by humans right uh, forensic examiners and super recognizers so we had to do some studies on that and so forth but uh, it gave you know amazingly impressive performance 10 power minus 7 false acceptance rate our true acceptance rate was 90% not on passport images or driver's license unconstrained faces okay so we we i've been doing face recognition since 1992 i cannot think of any other technique that would give this kind of a performance so now you know why computer vision people are so crazy about deep learning performance 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 so we can do simultaneously many things detect a face get, get the landmark points get the pose gender and if you are in our database we can tell you who you are and so forth and we can do also very complex situations a person being acquired in multiple different uh, places uh, ijbb and in the right you see cs6 which is a surveillance data several hundred people in the data set faces are uh, very very small and they are not looking at the camera it's a very complex problem we cannot even imagine doing them before deep learning came. Now we are able to do large galleries, 4 million identities, 14 million examples. And doing that, we understood that it is usually generalizable across other demographics. That was always a problem. If you train your face recognition set using one set of one group of people, will it work on others? It turns out if you have a very, very large number of identities that you train, uh, then it's maybe it's a little bit better. We are now doing it at 300 meters, 1,000 meters, 650 meters. At, at 1,000 meters, we can't even detect the face more than 40% of the time. There is facial deformities and turbulence and so forth. At 650 meters, we are able to get about 60% of the detected faces and then recognize them. So there's a new program from IARPA that looks into this. And, and then there was other kinds of data sets. So we are we have become bold because we are able to do you know a development of uh, you know consider very very difficult uh, data sets now I, I did the remote face recognition from 2008 to 2013 performance was not great 40 percent and so on so now we are at much higher performance there is another at scale problem we have looked at which is you know detection tracking and vehicle re-identification on traffic camera data sets what does this problem tell us is that there are curated data sets available for you to train a deep learning method, but you are going to actually test it on operational data that is collected by traffic cameras. There are th thousands of traffic cameras in the country and elsewhere. And you know they are not really that great in terms of uh, uh, frame rate or resolution and so forth. Of course, for years we have all toyed with the idea, let's make the bad data look good by doing super resolution and so forth. But when you have these kinds of uh, operational data, they are not always effective. So one thing you can do is you can do domain transfer, domain uh, adaptation from uh, the learning, you know, using the curated high quality data to make it work on operational data. So this is uh, another you know, challenge that uh, we, we are seeing when we look at this data set. So this is the problem for our IARPA. We are finishing it up at the end of this year. Uh, untrimmed, uh, you know, action detection and untrimmed videos. Okay. So typically in the early days of activity detection, we will be given a clip that just has the person doing the action, you know, bending down, just looking at the wristwatch, looking at the sky, this and that. Then it became a very, you know, video classification problem. But now we are given a big area like a parking lot where multiple actions may be happening. And so we have to do spatio-temporal localization. And that's a challenge. In fact, what happens there, uh, the performance measure is something known as PIM, is probability of missing a, an action. Now the best system in the program is 34%. So we are missing close to one third. It's not ready for deployment. Now the same actions are happening at an unknown facility there is even worse, 53% uh, we are missing, definitely not for deployment. The more serious thing is if there is a surprise activity, okay, then it becomes very bad, like 70% we miss or 60%, 60 to 65%. This is one thing you can take it. AI cannot handle surprises. You can make a t-shirt out of that. If you don't like AI, you can make a t-shirt on that because 
right now the way ai is practiced is based on training data so if you have not seen something and suddenly shows up you are going to be in trouble right so pathology is another application where we have the issue at scale problem uh, different labs have different ways of staining the samples and capturing the image and so you need to do domain adaptation, right? So that is uh, one of the things. So despite being a successful deep learning based methods of issues, uh, it's a nonlinear uh, mapping between data and labels, but we don't have a good analytical uh, basis for it, okay? And we are learning tons of parameters, tons of parameters, and uh, that still is a bothersome thing, although there are, methods for uh, you know, reducing uh, dropouts and this and that, but still the problem is there. Uh, and then in generalization, I, I told you there are a couple of examples in pathology, uh, in action detection, in unknown uh, facilities, and uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, you have to generalize. So data, if you training data is all you have seen, how, how well do you do that? and performance measure is not there and we can pile on, but that's okay. Uh, so three open problems I wanna briefly highlight, bias. Face recognition became very successful, immediately it drew the attention uh, as is, is this a good thing? And so I'll discuss briefly what the issue is and what we have done and domain adaptation. I'll give you some examples. The other thing that's been occupying our minds is the sensitivity of these deep learning systems. If you give a mildly altered training sample, you know, which, which the image is visually indistinguishable from the good training data that was used before, the label can be very different, right? I mean, this is a very drastic case of lack of robustness. And as you know, robust statistics goes back to Peter Huber's classical paper in 1972, Annals of Statistics, right? So there is plenty of thing to be done in the case of robust statistics and machine learning. Now, uh, this is the work done by researchers at MIT. They took three systems and uh, did the following experiment, a face recognition system and did the following experiment. They took the faces of uh, light-skinned females and males from Norway, dark-skinned females and males from African countries, and they want to gender classification. They found out that it didn't work very well for the dark-skinned uh, people, right? So this is the classic comparisons with Amazon recognition software. Amazon really got into some kind of a tiff on this one and they came back and they said they have improved it and so forth as the numbers indicate. DM stands for dark skin males, DF stands for dark skin females and light stands for light skin females, LM light skin males, etc. Okay. But but the problem is what was seen first as a face recognition bias has now morphed into AI bias. Anytime you talk about AI, then there is, oh, what about the bias? How do you know it's going to do properly for all subgroups and so forth? And then people from ethics are now involved and so on. So we have to address that. Since we build face recognition systems that we gave to the US government, we had the responsibility to kind of analyze it. So what we wanted to do was, we wanted to first find out if our face recognition systems have bias. So we, in the case of face recognition, there are obvious things that can create, gender can create bias, pose, age, uh, and, and skin tone. So there are certain things that we know. In fact, we did an experiment years ago. We tried to evaluate the performance face recognition system for seven attributes, whether the faces were collected indoors, outdoors, whether forehead was visible or not, whether somebody is wearing glasses or not, et cetera, et cetera. Now somebody has extended this to 47 attributes. So the thing is, if, if uh, your, your classifier depends on any one of these features, it's going to be probably sensitive to that. So what we did, we developed, we used a method that's already in the literature called MINE, Mutual Information Oral Estimation, to find out how much of the information regarding skin tone and uh, 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 gender is buried in our deep network. What we found is that if you are having 101 layer deep learning network, the bottom layers, you know, they didn't care much about identity. They were focusing on yeah and page and 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 uh, etc gender and then as you go up and up and up it basically <clears throat> focuses on <clears throat> verification id and so on and the same thing we saw <clears throat> with respect to skin tone and you know and also we saw this across many 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 neural networks the, the relative uh, bias was different there's the one that developed at, in imperial college showed less bias to gender, but more bias to skin tone and so forth. 
and in, and it, we actually even saw it as the training process was going on so uh, we said okay if uh, gender is somewhat you know coded in my representation then maybe that's one of the reasons why we have a bias to gender so we went and tried to develop a method you know suppressing the protected attributes this is pass we just presented in a conference a couple of weeks ago in, in a computer vision conference so the idea is what one thing you can do if there is bias you can say okay i'm going to drop what i did I'm going to start a brand new data set, brand new training, et cetera, et cetera, so that it doesn't have bias. Yeah, you can do that. But we still do not understand you know, how much of data balancing you know, is going to affect the bias and things like that. In the early days, people thought if only you balance the data set, the bias will be fine. That's not true. So what we said was, okay, there are all these good networks. Facebook has one, Google has one, et cetera, et cetera. Why don't we take it and then we try to suppress the bias and then we do a retraining, you know, taking into account the covariates that it depends on like gender, skin tone and so forth. So that's what you see here. We take a frozen network features and then we have the ensemble. Can you hear me well? Yes, yes, we can. Yeah, okay. So the ensembles E1, E2, EK, et cetera, one is gender, one is pose, one is age, one is skin tone, and so on. So uh, we have an ICCV 2021 paper on this. So we take an existing system and try to uh, suppress the expression of things that could cause uh, bias. Of course, when you want to suppress, it has to go through another learning thing. It's, it's like, you know, you you uh, learn uh, tennis from somebody and then you change your teacher and then the teacher says, wait a minute, that's not the way you hold your four, forehand stroke. And so they have to suppress something and so you can teach what they, you know, something similar to that. And, uh, you know, we did this for skin tone, we did it for gender. And uh, as you can see in the right diagram, uh, you know, first crystal phase is from Marilyn. And, uh, you know, we have a 10 power minus five four, you know, it was like, quite you know high and then you know we brought it down green is the one after the bias thing has been taken care of and so on so it, it involves a combination of uh, various loss functions i mean that's one thing that has become clear loss functions are, are the things that you can use to guide your deep learning network to learn what you want it to learn right there is the you know, we set up the ensemble thing in an adversarial loss function uh, situation. So I many these details are in the paper. So, okay, so this is uh, for gender and we also did it for skin tone. Uh, you know, you can see from, you know, red to green and uh, you have, you can do uh, each, uh, you know, skin tone and gender sequentially, you can do them simultaneously and so forth. So there is a way now but not all problems clearly tell you where the bias may come from, right? In the case of phase, it's natural. Maybe think maybe it's gender, maybe it's uh, skin tone and so on. But if you do general object recognition, we have to think a little harder. So we need methods for uncovering bias, where the bias could come from. So we need more techniques for that. What we did is a small thing. Okay, so then we also uh, have another, uh, okay, I'm sorry. We have a thing called bias performance. You know, when, when we try to reduce bias, sometimes the performance goes down. So now we have two things here. Uh, why does it go down? In the early studies, we will reduce the number of males in the data set so that the male to male comparison numbers, and the female to female comparison numbers were the same. When you do that, then you kind of reduce the training data set and therefore, the performance goes down. So we thought we have to have a way of compensating uh, for that. So if you look at them together, then maybe you can you know, guide the deep learning network uh, to um, you know, pro behave properly. Nobody likes to have bias, right? I mean, deep learning. Uh, so, but th then you have to decide you know, where, where you want to settle down for bias in terms of performance and so forth. It's a design, design problem. So here we show, you know, gender bias analysis using crystal phase. I have similar numbers for arc phase, but, uh, you know, I'm not showing too many tables at this talk. So 0.847, you know, the, the maximum number value can be one for pass. That is our thing. When you do multi-pass, sometimes it doesn't do that well. Uh, whereas for skin tone, uh, for gender, for skin tone, multi-pass does well, 0 0.639, which is higher than 0 0.261. So this is uh, ongoing. This All this work was presented, but uh, now we are doing something uh, more. 
we looked at the activation maps, you know, before and after bias correction. So if you look at the front row, you can see male to male activation map is different from female to female activation map. So the question is, should I keep them look very similar? And then what would be the network uh, that can achieve it? So you can, you know, ask the question, can I keep these two things from a trained network, you know, uh, be as close as possible and then develop a, a network that is not as biased as before and so forth. So that is something we did using a, what we call as a distill and debias, basically a student teacher uh, network combination where one of them is better at, at being unbiased than the other and transfers that knowledge or distills that knowledge to the other network and things like that. So this is under review. So there are all of these things going on. So now we can actually put the various algorithms for face matching in the bias performance plot. Where do you want to be? You want to be in the top left corner, low bias and high performance. So you can actually do this. Everything is empirical here, remember, right? Uh, except for the mind, uh, which requires some optimization methods and so forth, um, everything is a uh, thing. But you know, statistics deals with the bias quite a bit well. You know, There is a classic regression problem. Uh, you have errors and variable problem when the observations are corrupted by noise and the regression model itself has noise. Then you know, if you don't do properly, there is the bias and bias compensated least squares. And then the maximum likelihood we can write for the noisy observations and then identifiability. So all of this is there. So calculating bias uh, in estimation theory is a very fundamental thing. So, but it becomes very hard when you have a hierarchical nonlinear network, right? So that is a problem. So second challenge we have is domain adaptation. This, this is a very old problem, but since 2010 has gotten a second life, third life, whatever. The idea is the test data you know, for a classifier may not come from the same distribution as the training data, right? So how do you handle that? Well, uh, there are many you know, heuristic methods that people have done before uh, and so on. But now this was done in a semi-supervised setup by folks at Berkeley. Um, and there's of course a closely related thing called transfer learning. What we did in 2011, we want to do unsupervised domain adaptation. That means the, the source data, that is the training data has labels, <clears throat> the target data on which your classifier will be attempted doesn't have labels. You know, if you don't have any labels, what is the best classifier you can synthesize, you can design? It's the principal component based method, right? I can take everything in the source data and then, you know, get the subspace thing and put it on Grassmannian. I can take everything on the target, put it on the Grassmannian, and then I can interpolate between them and create many intermediate representations. I can take the source and the target data, reflect on those intermediate bases, construct a long vector, maybe do a dimensionality reduction, and then find out which is the nearest source table, uh, sample for the given target table and give it the label, right? This is a thing that we can do, uh, not having the labels for the target data set. So this is what we did because you know there are closed form expressions for walking on the Grassmannian manifold and so forth. It's almost like having TCA at many, many intermediate points between source and the target faces, right? Now, uh, this is fine. And then of course, uh, we all had uh, a good 10 years with dictionaries and this and that. So we also developed similar domain adaptation methods using dictionaries. Uh, and then since uh, deep learning was already there, this is 2014, 2015, we threw in some max pooling and some hierarchy and things like that. And, you know, so it, it worked better than what we had with manifolds. And then more recently, a few years ago, we did it using generative adversarial networks. This is a very, very complex domain adaptation problem. I want to segment a real scene. And if I want to have the training data, then I should have labels for every pixel in the training data, which is cumbersome. So you start with the synthetic data, which somewhat looks like the real data. For example, what I have as a synthetic data here is a grand theft auto uh, video sequence or a Cynthia video sequence. And then I have real data and we do adaptation through a GAN, right? Generative adversity. And this will actually work better than previous approaches. And there are a lot of people doing that okay so now domain adaptation on traffic camera is very important because i do have the real operational data the data that the traffic camera collects who has the time to annotate them no there's just too much data thousands of cameras and they're working tirelessly collecting so you really can't uh, sit down and annotate them but there is some data set available curated 
clean data as part of a challenge that they call as AI city challenge and so on. So the question is, how do you uh, manage this? So we basically <clears throat> make our good data look like a bad data and then you know go uh, using a cycle GAN. This is one of the basic things you can do. Uh, and then, so we have the annotations now, so we can train and then hope this can be generalized to uh, the operational traffic camera data. So domain adaptation is extremely important here. So when you do that, your performance goes up 77% and things like that. If you straight away try to uh, do without domain adaptation, take the network that was trained on the clean curated data and then run it on the real operational data, the performance is 37%, obviously not good. So this idea of covariance shift, data shift is very well known in statistics. And so we need to, uh, Look at that. If we are going to design your neural networks or the so-called AI machines using data, data shift is something that one has to worry about. So you can also do it for uh, typical examples on the operational data, right? Uh, some small things are hard to get, uh, but big ones you can get with varying degrees of uh, confidence, accuracy, and things like that. Now. Uh, we, one of the challenging problems is vehicle re-identification. This is at city scale. Right. It's not uh, just a few cameras nearby city scale, separated by many, many tens of kilometers. So it goes from one view, shows up at some other view. We want to know if these two are the same things. Of course, with the car automobiles looking very similar, it's a hard problem. So we developed a couple of methods for this using domain adaptation. And, uh, you know, there are three boxes here. The middle one is your classic deep learning thing. So don't worry about it. The left one has two domain adaptation boxes because we have two different kinds of data very very wild the interesting thing is the the, the rightmost uh, box where we have same camera removal what we notice just like in the case of face recognition we had bias to gender and skin tone here the the algorithm was uh, biased by camera particular camera okay so you have to kind of remove that camera bias. Otherwise, it was creating problem when you try to pro use the deep learning network for another camera. So data, when you are using it to design deep learning, it's going to have data shift issues. So you have to work on that. So we also uh, you know, adopted another method that has been tried for re-ID re of persons for vehicles, you know, incorporating a domain adaptation. And of course, when you do a challenge, you go through these, uh, you know, benchmarks and so forth. And we are number eight in the re-ID and number five in the tracking and so forth. There's a lot of competition. I think the left, left, right picture, 100 results were given. So eight out of 100. And the first one is five out of 23, I think. So, you know, this is an ongoing effort People who have more data always win. People who have more GPUs always win. Uh, but then you have to work hard and come up with smarter ideas to compete with them. So that's just the way it is right now, right? There, there is actually a lot of talk about democratizing AI and uh, uh, people are looking at, you know, releasing models that are trained on large data sets and things like that. The third issue that we have to worry about adversarial example. So here, even with a small amount of data, the lion can be a pelican, the sports car can be a speedboat, the traffic signal can be genes. The second and third things are not a problem, but you sure don't want to mistake a lion to be a pelican. That's not good for your health. So what do you do? Okay, there are various kinds of attacks that people have talked about. To me, coming from time series background from my undergraduate uh, student days and random fields and so on, I think this outlier issue uh, is known before, right? The severity here is the one that is surprising. For example, there is a very nice paper in 1979, Journal of Royal Statistical Society by Doug Martin, who used to be at University of Washington. He was the guy who was pushing for robust time series analysis. Basically what the M estimator for regression, he called it generalized M estimator for time series and so forth. Uh, he showed that in the case of time series, the outliers need not be very large. They can be as small as the noise processes that drive the time series to create havoc. So when you have a correlated observations, the outliers can be small and still can cause havoc. And when you have a nonlinear regression model, hierarchical nonlinear regression model, then all bets are off. So this is a big thing that's occupying people's mind. Uh, Professor Goldstein and I, we are involved in a DARPA project uh, I have a few colleagues from Hopkins involved. Professor Feisy from Maryland is involved. So there are all kinds of uh, disturbing models and so on. Some that uh, use the gradient information 
uh, from the uh, deep learning themselves and, the, and so forth. So we did some work years ago, a generative approach called defense scan that was broken. And now we are looking at something called patch attack. Suppose you have object detector in the left picture, you know, toilet point nine something, sink is point something, etc. we can recognize. In the right side, we have a small patch attack. You may see that some, you know, kind of a little uh, patch there, uh, and then it brings everything down. So the question here is, how do I take care of it? Well, I can, I have to have, a, we developed a method that uh, that's, was evaluated by DARPA for the guard program. Basically, we figure out where the uh, patches uh, segment and then complete, and then, you know, we can either blacken it or we can do some in painting and then kind of smooth it out and so forth and then run your object detector. Okay, now uh, they have to make this insensitive to the shape of the uh, patch, the size of the patch and, and, and so on. But if the patch is sitting right on the target, there's not a whole lot we can do. Uh, so we tested it, and then you can see on the first row, MS Coco is a challenging object data set. On the first row, as the patch size increases, accuracy goes down to 9%, 9.9%. SAAC is a student, uh, it's a method my student developed, it's from 49 to 44, and so on. So this is going, but when the DARPA T and E team evaluated this, they reduced the, the disturbance magnitude by half. That means detection itself became a problem. So if you can't detect the patch, you can't really fix it. So this is a cat and mouse game, but this is something that has to be looked at. So when you do that, the toilet is back at 0.9 and things like that. So this is uh, there's a lot of work going on in this domain. We have to also do it for aerial images uh, with the patch. The performance goes down. You you take care of the patch, and then the numbers are up again and things like that. Okay. So I have so far talked about what's happening with deep learning and et cetera, et cetera, and computer vision and so on. So we identified three issues, bias, domain adaptation, generalization, okay? Domain adaptation. Third one is adversary attack. Now I have five, six problems that I want uh, my friends in stat and math to help me with so that we can sustain the growth of AI. The first one is domain generalization. Domain adaptation assumes both source and target data are available so I can mediate between them. Domain generalization is a real application. I have no idea what the target distribution will be, but I can collect as much of source as I can and hope I can generalize well. So there is a regularization framework here that we proposed. They call it meta, meta uh, learning, you know, learning to learn, you know, all these fancy names. So this is a big thing. Be being able to handle distributions that uh, we have not trained on. It's a great problem for statisticians to look at, okay? Now, model pruning optimization. I, I cut my teeth in statistics by developing a method for designing or deciding the number of AR and moving average parts in an ARMA model. This is late 70s, 1977 to 79. If you remember, those of you who are working in time series analysis, there's a famous uh, criterion known as Bayes information criterion. Uh, Gideon Schwartz in 1978 developed this. And uh, before that, there was an okay case criterion, which was inconsistent. My professor actually did this in October 1977, but somehow Gideon Schwartz gets all the credit for doing it in March 1978. It's actually not even a full paper analysis of statistics. It's one of those little correspondence, uh, we call it, right? But that's what you know everybody talks about. Now, of course, it's hard to do this for deep learning, right? Why? Because it's hierarchical, it's not linear, blah, blah, blah. So there is this whole thing going on, neural architecture search. It'll be very interesting you know, to, for you to know that we recently looked at this problem for 3D segmentation problem in medical images, right? 3D segmentation, what is the best neural architecture? And a state-of-the-art method, it can take a whole GPU, one day full of GPU processing to come up with some a reasonable thing. So it's a very, very hard problem because you have so many things that can change here. In the case of autoregressive model, it's just a model order, one guy, right? So your, your base information criterion was the n log row plus, uh, you know, mk times log n, where n is the number of data, and rho is the variance of the kth model, rho k, and, uh, you know, and so on. And you can show it is consistent and et cetera, et cetera. But when you have a deep learning model, lots of things change. So this neural architecture search is uh, something as a hypothesis testing problem and a very complex one. So that is something that you can help. And then mathematical models for deep learning. As I said, data to decision is an alchemy right now using deep learning, right? 
uh, you know. So if that works very well most of the time, people may not care why it's working, not working. I think right now we are caring because we know it's not working every time, all the time. So we want answers. So there is a new MURI uh, that I'm fortunate to be involved with along with all the people who are uh, listed here. And uh, it started last year. We already finished a one year report. And these are the questions that are being asked by this MURI. I can't go through all of them, but as you can see, Ron DeVore is an approximation theory expert, and Ryan Tipsharan is a statistical learning person. Rob Novak is active learning. Stan Wosher is optimization. Moshe Wardi is uh, logical model and uh, how logical reasoning can be helpful in deep learning. And Tom does lots of things. In, adversary learning bias and, and so on. Rich Perniak is interested in putting a lot of local things together to create a global model, you know, which is not there yet in, in deep learning. And I look at the applications of these things for 4D scene modeling, but there is plenty of math that's going on here. So you should keep track of this. Generative adversary network is a synthesis model, right? Nonlinear synthesis model. It, this has become a big deal since 2014. And, uh, you know, those of you who have not seen this the idea is very simple. Uh, you, you take a nice printer and you take a nice piece of paper and try to print a hundred dollar bill, take it to the bank. The teller says, this is not real, go away. And then you buy a better printer and better paper. And this goes on back and forth. Finally, the teller says, oh, that looks like a real hundred dollar bill. Here you go and gives you five twenties. Don't try that. This is illegal. But this is what it is done between a discriminator and generator. And once it converges, generator now can produce samples that look, at least in the distribution sense, very much like your training data. So first it was suggested as a data augmentation method. Now we are using it for almost everything. One of my former students, Dr. Mingyu Lu, who is a distinguished scientist and NVIDIA as a survey paper and proceedings at Tripoli in May 2021, um, narrating the whole, uh, you know, development of GANs, some amazing quality being generated. The reason why it's becoming interesting is people are saying we don't have data to annotate, especially in DO some DOD applications and so on. Can synthetic data be used to train AI? So, so that is where the GANs are coming. So that's a big open area. And this is another problem is getting attention. It's a well-known problem. I have already trained a deep learning network. I still have 10 million data sets available. At a time, I want to take 1,000 pieces of that in a mini batch setup. I know which of these 1,000 I should keep. Well, I want to keep, uh, I want to use something that will improve the performance of the classifier, will give me guarantee of uh, less bias or no, bi no increase in bias, will have proper representation. So this can be posed as an optimization problem. We had some preliminary work years ago using a watershed algorithm, but best subset training is again, that is uh, very much in the statistics world, but this is a big problem. At, at Hopkins, we have something known as PMAP, Precision uh, Medicine Application uh, med Analytics Platform, uh, PMAP, where all kinds of data can be sitting, you know, the diagnostic data, the uh, EHR, you know, and then health records and the doctor's opinions, how the patient feels, how do you mine this? And there are at least two uh, professors I know at Hopkins, many more, uh, Scott Seeger and, and Shimura, I think, they develop Bayesian, hierarchical Bayesian, models. One of the things that surprised me is when, I, I forgot to mention this, but you know, SVMs came. We also had a cousin of SVM, so-called relevance vector machine. Relevance vector machine is a classical Bayesian hierarchical approach, right? It will have a prior on prior, and then it will decide which parameter should be kept. And that's why it became, uh, you know, a sparse representation. Beautiful, the Bishop's 2000 paper. Somehow it didn't take off. So SVM survived. And of course, SVM survived, but purely deterministic. And then people had to throw some things into it to make it, you know, give some confidence metric and so forth. So statics, statistics sometimes, uh, you know, uh, didn't work out that way. Yeah, anyway, uh, so looking ahead, AI is here to stay. Whatever you want to call it, yeah, whichever you want to call it, it's there. At scale problems and statisticians are never afraid of at scale problems. And it does, AI does not adapt, it's not learning. So we need to consider bias, domain adaptation, robustness, and then move away from black box decision-making. What is coming more, becoming more interesting is human, human centric AI, right? How humans will work with AI. I talked about forensic examiners and uh, machine learning algorithms for face recognition working together. We have a PNAS 2018 paper on that. So that is becoming more and more 
interesting you know human computer interaction has been there for a long time and then we had the human robot interactions for safe workplaces now we have to look at how ai and humans would work together especially in the context of medicine right there is patient there is the doctor there is the ai so how they are going to work together and things like that and synthetic ai as i just mentioned before is becoming a big deal now and uh, rigorous math will be a good medicine for the alchemy of deep learning that's very very true uh, so um, of course the ai's impact on medicine and healthcare is something i'm very excited about uh, we are one of the three uh, universities to have received a 20 million five dollar five year grant from national institute of aging uh, hawkins Uh, university of massachusetts and harvard and then university of pennsylvania the goal is to explore ai methods and technologies and reasoning for healthier uh, aging as well as uh, for you know uh, dementia alzheimer's disease and things like that so uh, uh, this is uh, something we just started off uh, about two months ago and we are quite excited uh, to see how this this will go of course uh, hopkins uh, i moved to hopkins so that i can explore the ai space and medicine i'm having weekly conversations with pathologists and endocrinologists doctors there's a lot of excitement in terms of what we can do there are some challenges they don't always have tons of data you know because of the cost involved in collecting data from patients and so on you know sometimes data size is much much smaller so being able to learn from small data is very important so ai's role in prediction prevention and diagnosis of diseases will fundamentally change how medicine will be practiced and care will be delivered so i think there are a lot of good things but i think we need more foundational uh, research from mathematicians and statisticians and i will and benefit greatly from that and so will many other colleagues of mine so i'm going to stop here uh,